Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is Bob Mendelson, and this is the Bob's Your Uncle podcast. Today we speak about pride and inclusion and clothes wearing and rugby league. How does that all go together? Stay tuned. Thanks for joining me for this Bob's Your Uncle podcast, season one, episode 22. Of note, the opinions are strictly my own. You can now find us and comment to us wherever you get your podcasts. iHeartRadio, Apple iTunes, Spotify, Google, the list goes on. We have a lot of topics to discuss. Even so, on the Bob's Your Uncle podcast, you are part of the show. We want to see and hear you. And we'll talk about loads more topics as the season goes on. Let's see where the spirit takes us. Whether you're at home, online, on the road with me in your headset at the gym, or out for your evening constitutional, wherever you get your podcast, that's where we will be. Thanks for being with us these 18 minutes. Amanda McGinnis is both my personal travel agent and the sponsor of this podcast, and it will help all three of us if you book your next trip with her, including hotel and flights and all things tourist. How to reach her? Use the URL shortener bit.ly and you'll get to her phone and email. So type into your browser bit.ly stroke Amanda365 and you'll find her photo and her information at travelpartners.com.au. Contact her directly for tours and flights and cruises and deals. I've used her for years. She'll give you very good advice. Now, back to the podcast. (whistles) Historical Marker of the Week. On this date in history, 28 July, using the assassination of the Austrian Archduke Francis Ferdinand as a pretext to present Serbia with an unacceptable ultimatum, Austria-Hungary declared war on the Slavic country on this day in 1914, beginning World War I. And in 1868, the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which granted citizenship and equal civil and legal rights to black Americans and slaves who had been emancipated after the Civil War, entered into force. This was good news for all the males, 21 years of age or older, but not for Indians or women or those who practiced insurrection as they were similarly excluded. And that's the historical marker of the week. Mr. Bob Catter is a member of parliament here in Canberra from Innisfail in Mount Isa up in Queensland. He's been a longtime member since 1993, and he's 77 years old. He stirred some already foaming waters this week with a speech in the mural hall at the nation's capital. The topic was rugby which should really only be a point of contention on the weekends when one team goes up against another. And that will certainly happen tonight as the Manly Sea Eagles will host the Sydney Roosters in a do-or-go-home clash at Brookvale Oval. Catter's speech in the hall ended and he fielded some questions. What had his knickers in a knot anyway? This week there was controversy with seven players who play for the Sea Eagles who announced that they would refuse to wear a jersey in the game for tonight. Why not? This weekend is titled Pride Weekend, which is a ridiculous nomenclature, but it has to do with gay and lesbian folks being included and allowed to participate in this code of football. Maybe they should have called it Everyone Weekend or Including Weekend, but someone came up with Pride and the logo of Pride is a rainbow. That's it, a simple rainbow on the jumper. And then, of course, there would be commensurate images in use in other adverts and such. I'm putting the Daily Mail article about this speech by Mr. Catter in the notes on the podcast. Oh, by the way, I I love a good rainbow, and in fact saw one last weekend over the Sydney Cricket Ground while watching my Sydney Swans play and win over the Adelaide Crows, but that topic's for another day. The rainbow is a beautiful symbol that some people in religion attribute to God, the Creator, who first highlighted the rainbow as symbol in the book of Genesis. 
And rather than wait till the Bible reading section today, I'll read it here. Genesis 9, God said this, I set my rainbow in the cloud and it shall be for a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. It shall come about when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow will be seen in the cloud. And again, when the rainbow is in the cloud, then I will look upon it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that's on the earth. That's it. That's the quote. Fairly straightforward. The rainbow is a sign of an agreement, a handshake, and more than that, a contract between the deity named God and the people of earth, who at that moment numbered only eight, that is Noah and his family. For Noah, who had just endured 12 months inside a floating zoo after 40 days of continuous rain and then the 325 days of receding floodwaters, the sign of the rainbow was a good thing. God had just promised he would not flood the earth entirely again, and to prove it, he sent the rainbow. And for centuries, the rainbow represented God in his covenant. Only in the last century was the rainbow used to represent gays and lesbians and their desire for representation and for equality in the workplace and throughout society. More letters have been added to the ID uh, for rainbows, but that's not my point in this episode today. Back to the Parliament, Bob Catter railed in an answer about what the Sea Eagles should have done. Mr. Catter took rugby league itself on, saying that the game should not have been used to promote a politic or a religion. He made sure we all knew of his own family and the love of the game they all share, and that it's the game and the game alone which ought to be promoted by each club and each sportsman. That, that makes sense in a way, but there's a problem. The Manly Sea Eagles play football at Four Pines Park. For those who don't know, Four Pines is a new sponsor of the club since last year and is a beer brewing company. The Oval, built in 1911, used to be called Lotto Land before Four Pines. The sponsors are not usually of interest to any player. That is, the players play for teams with nicknames like, I don't know, Demons or Blue Devils, but... They're not really supporting demonic activity. Similarly, whether the team's owners may have made their millions or billions in Coors Park, in brewing beer, or in sales of products owned by whites or whatever, or whoever, players play sports. And that's independent of the morality of the owners. I guess that's what makes me curious about the seven manly players who won't wear a certain jersey tonight. They had no issue playing with a jersey that the front and center of it boasted gambling as points bet is the major sponsor. Most of the religious seven probably don't gamble, and I'm sure if you ask them if their religion allowed for gambling, well, they would insist it does not. Even so, they wear that usual jersey without flinching. I'm also guessing that their religion doesn't boast about drinking of beer, and yet they play most happily in Four Pines Park. This is where some fans shake their heads. Why select homosexuality as the sin of choice, that is, the one that must be stood up against? Shouldn't the sin of drunkenness or the sin of wanton gambling and of any other greed-inducing addiction be included? I don't usually agree with radio personalities Kyle Sandilands and Jackie O, but they brought up similar issues earlier this week. The Daily Mail reported this, or I would know nothing of it. I don't listen to Kyle and Jackie O. Here's what they are reported. Quote, the whole excuse of religion doesn't make sense. If they're all playing in a stadium sponsored by alcohol and all the jerseys are sponsored by a gaming company, it makes no sense, Sandaland said. Jackie O added, but they're okay to talk about gambling and encourage that. Sandaland said everyone should Take a moment to think about the seven players' feelings, suggesting people that furiously oppose homosexuality are often insecure about their sexuality themselves. Jackie O said the players boycotting the jerseys were mean. I'll put their comments in the notes on the podcast as well. Okay, so those players will not play tonight in the game, and according to the team chairman, Scott Penn, they will play in this game next year, and the seven have sorted out what ailed them, which in the news today was about being heard. At least that's what the media is reporting. 
Is Bob Catter right? Should no rugby team's advertising be allowed on a team's jersey? Should no team ever speak up for morality or religion or a politician? It's a smudged line, certainly blurry to be sure. Catter said, I'll just quote him a couple times here, whether you agree or not is irrelevant. They don't want to wear the jersey because of their moral convictions. Then he switched to the leaders of rugby league, certainly of Manly, and said they should never have used our game, meaning rugby league, to promote their private opinions. That should never come into the game. He even used the word prostitute to describe what the league, or at least Manly, did to the game. He said they prostituted the great game and use it to promote their beliefs, whether they are good beliefs or bad beliefs. That's the complete opposite of what rugby league is. I remember the uproar caused by rugby great Israel Falau, who in his private Instagram and Twitter had stood up for what he saw was biblical righteousness. He made his religious beliefs clear and should have been allowed to do so, except that he had signed a document with the club earlier that year to help him toe the line. What was shocking was that his team had made him sign such a muzzling document at all. Who are they to tell him what he can or cannot say about his own personal religious beliefs? Ah, the liberals can be liberal with everyone except conservatives, right? Falau was relegated and dismissed, gone in a heartbeat. His financial considerations were severe. I'm talking about this today because Katter's comments caught the ears of the Jewish community in which I participate here in Australia. Why? Are they all of a sudden worried about rugby and manly and football? No. Katter held his Bible aloft and said that persecutors have been around for 5,000 years persecuting anyone and everyone who believed in that book, the Bible. He chose one example, and that was the six million Jewish people who died in the Holocaust. Anytime someone compares anything to the Holocaust, the Jewish community hears and reacts, usually with disdain or some level of rejection, as nothing even comes close to our loss. To be fair, Kater went on to talk about Aborigines, for he represents many there in Mount Isa, and even his own heritage. And he brought in lots of other examples, but the media didn't report those. I'm not sure that he got the representation correct about the six million who died in the Holocaust. He said that they died because they believed in the book. I think it was much more racial rather than theological. I don't know that every Jew who went to the ovens believed in the Bible. I certainly know that many today who went through those ovens or escaped them, many of the people with whom I speak here in Sydney and around the country, to this day don't believe in the Bible or the God who wrote that Bible, but are in in one way or another, and for whatever reason, they were allowed to get out. Some were very, very young, so they're in their 70s and 80s at this point. I remember a beautiful, tall, Austrian Jewish man named Joseph, with whom I used to speak often when we had our bookshop around the corner from where we are currently. And one day he came in and wondered where God was during the Holocaust. It was a question that we hear regularly, and we never seem to have a satisfactory answer. Because how do you answer the question of suffering with anything except a hug and sitting with someone and being with someone? They're not really asking the theological question. They're saying, won't someone be with me as I grieve? And this was 50, 60, even now 70 years on since the close of the Holocaust. I remember asking Joseph if he really wanted an answer. And he shocked me by saying, yes, I do. I said, please sit down. And I sent up a quick prayer towards heaven, almost in a way a grunt, and sat down next to Joseph. And I said, I don't understand the grief you have, 
the loss of some of your family. Most, he said, most of my family. And I, I put my hand on his arm and said, Joseph, I don't know the pain you to this day still feel, but I know someone who went through it and someone who would identify with you and someone who really understands this heartache that you have. His name is Yeshua. And he, unlike you and unlike your family, was innocent. Oh, I know that some of your friends and your uncle and your mother and others you would think of as innocent, but realistically we all sin. But here was a man, his name was Yeshua, who suffered needlessly. He never sinned. And he was rejected. He was crucified. He was dismissed out of hand by a Jewish community in the first century and by most people to this day because he represented God, God's love, God's kindness. I may not understand, but he understands your pain and he suffered on your behalf. He took your sins and your uncle's and even your mother's sins on himself and he offers to you eternal life. What will you do with such a man? That answer went right to the heart of my friend Joseph. I don't know what he's thinking today about that. I do know that that moment spoke to him. Maybe it speaks to you as well. What do you think about all these things? Why don't you write me on bobmendo at aol.com or comment or even video to me on Instagram or Twitter at Bob's Your Uncle PC. I'd love to know what you think about all these things. Don't forget to post a review on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you're listening, and share our podcast with your mates, your friends, everyone. Thanks for helping us get known out there. Also, please follow or subscribe to the podcast and hit like as well. You, we can use all the good speak we can get. Don't forget to book all your travel needs with Amanda McInnes at travelpartners.com.au. And next week, we hope to discuss euthanasia and the healthcare industry with a Jewish nurse in Detroit, Michigan. Until then, from me, Bob Mendelson, when things seem bleak or uncertain, look up to God. He's in his heaven. And Bob's your uncle. Shalom from Sydney. <laughs>